All righty, let's uh, move on to the cardiomyopathies. Um, first thing I want to mention about that is that we do have three kinds of cardiomyopathies that we basically uh, put them in these three categories. One is hypertrophic, one is dilated, and one is restrictive. And uh, we'll kind of talk about that in, in a second here. Um, you can see where cardiomyopathy just means cardio, heart, myo, muscle, pathy, pathology. So uh, whatever kind of cardiac muscle pathology that we're talking about is, is the general category here. So hypertrophic, I think uh, most people by the time they got to the pathophysiology stage are already uh, familiar with the hypertrophic part of it. Basically what that means is the, the, the heart, usually talking about the left ventricle, is, is big. Okay, it's big and fat. So um, if we're talking about, you know, these are you know, the different chambers of the heart, mostly we're talking about this, this left ventricle part being hypertrophic, as in being really thick muscle, okay? Uh, the problem with that, as you can see as I'm drawing this, is if you have a very too thick of muscle, it is cutting down the size of the lumen or where you can put the blood, and therefore it's going to, you know, decrease your uh, end diastolic volume, and of course it would decrease your stroke volume too. Okay, if you had a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, reasons that you can get that, um, they're probably the number one, I'm going to say, is, is high blood pressure over a long period of time because the, the heart muscle is just like any other muscle. Is if, you, if you have to work it too hard, it's going to get thicker, which if they're biceps, that's awesome. If, uh, if it's your heart muscle, then, well, not so awesome. Okay. Um, so that's the first kind, hypertrophic. I think it's pretty straightforward, pretty self-explanatory. Um, obviously, this is one of the uh, diseases that you not only see when you have high blood pressure, but you would, you would also see it if there were, happened to be uh, like exogenous human growth hormone intake. And because, again, human growth hormone will make people's muscles bigger, sure, but it also will make their heart muscle bigger. And, in fact, that is why some people who are taking HGH uh, end up dying in their, you know, mid-40s to early 50s um, when they look awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, that does happen. Okay? And sometimes, obviously, it's not, you know, uh, high blood pressure or just taking human growth hormone exogenously. It, it's, you know... Somebody just happened to have a lot of growth hormone, and you think about, you know, uh, some of these uh, um, Andre the Giant or people like that that, in fact, has had a lot of growth hormone, and they got really big, uh, but then they ended up dying early in his case, which was unfortunate that uh, that happened to him, okay, through no fault of his own, I am sure. Anyway, second uh, kind of cardiomyopathy that I want to discuss is dilated cardiomyopathy, okay? Dilated cardiomyopathy, I think about dilated cardiomyopathy like a big floppy heart. So, you know, if this is the normal size of somebody's heart, let's just say dilated is, is going to be this size, right? And I know that's not what your heart looked like, but whatever. Um, okay, so it's, it's a big floppy heart, okay? And one of the things I wanted to point out about dilated cardiomyopathy is that as that heart muscle gets bigger, it's really stretching is what's really happening. Um, so if you're, you go back and you look at the, the individual uh, sarcomere, right? And say you have your um, actin and myosin here, okay? This is your actin and myosin. Remember that with the little grabbing on, you know, with the little myosin heads and causing contractions and, and that sort of thing. These are arrows whatever, um, you know, and, and contracting your muscle inward, right? Okay, so you have that example, um, and then maybe you have one that's, uh, uh, if this is normal, right, um, then you have some space where you can grab on your actin and myosin, right? Um, well, you know, you can also certainly have one where it's, you know, too close together, and I know I'm not an artist, but there you have it, and then you, you won't be able to actually contract very much at all if the if the fibers are too close together, this would be in your in your most uh, contracted state of a muscle. Um, oops, I just knocked everything over. But uh, or you can have like dilated cardiomyopathy. You could have it where you know you, you have something similar to this, where your actin and myosin, the, the the muscle is so stretched so far apart um, that you can't really grab very well the myosin heads on the actin and you get very little uh, contraction, okay? And you can actually demonstrate this entire concept if you uh, think about doing a pull-up, 
right? If you think about doing a pull-up and you're just kind of hanging there. Um, all right, let's try it. We'll, we'll, we'll try a little artwork here. All right, so there's my, that's my pull-up bar. And, and the person is kind of like here and they're kind of like hanging there. I know arms aren't supposed to come out of the neck, but you know, this isn't art. Anyway, so here's this person. He's just kind of hanging there. Okay, if you think about that, his muscles are probably more like right about here. They're very stretched at that point. And you know that already. If you ever tried to do a pull-up, you know at the very beginning, it's very, very hard to do that pull-up, right? Um, but then as you, maybe, maybe you cheated a little, maybe you jumped up a little bit, you know, and you got it going so that your muscle got to its normal length. And as you start getting closer and closer up, I'm not really sure how to draw that. Let's move this guy's head up. You know, and you, and you get closer and closer up towards that bar, um, then your muscle gets even shorter. And at the very end, if you look at the very end, if this guy, you know, you're trying, you got your chin where you're trying to get it right over that bar or something like that, you know, and, and you're at that point of it and your muscles are very, very contracted at that point, you know, that's also extremely difficult, right? So optimally, optimally, you want to be in this normal range. And that's, as you know, like I said, if you ever did a pull up, you know that that's the most efficient part of it. Well, dilated cardiomyopathy is this one down here where you're all stretched out, can't really get a good grip. And because of that, I call dilated cardiomyopathy a big floppy heart. So went kind of a long way to get there, but that's the way I think about it is dilated cardiomyopathy is a big floppy heart. And uh, it's going to be big, sure, but it's not going to be hypertrophic. It's going to be, in fact, thinner, more like a balloon if you take a balloon and, you know, it's not blown up yet. The walls are still fairly thick. On the other hand, if you take a balloon and you blow it up to it's just about ready to pop, the walls are very, very thin. So that's kind of how I think about the dilated cardiomyopathy is like very thin walls. Um, it can't really contract very well because the fibers are so stretched out at the sarcomere. And uh, I call it like a big floppy heart because, again, it just it's a big heart, you know, and, you, and it tries to contract. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. You just can't really... Boom. It can't really contract. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so there's that one. And I'll talk about one reason that you guys really need to know that that causes that. Okay. Our third kind of heart um, dilated, I mean, our third kind of cardiomyopathy is, is the one restrictive right here. So you can see restrictive. Um, think about your heart. Um, again, normal sized. Okay. But what happened is something got caught in the heart muscles okay so a couple of different uh conditions that i can think of right off hand about restrictive cardiomyopathy is one called hemochromatosis or hemochromatosis where you get uh iron somebody has a lot of iron in their blood and it's a genetic thing but they get a lot of iron in their blood and then you know it over years will actually like to be deposited in heart muscle and if you can imagine this as little iron chips or iron flakes all throughout the heart muscle that's going to be very difficult to contract that heart to or expand it right um the the contraction and dilation is going to be very difficult because it's a crunchy heart now it's like filled with little flakes of metal um and that's called hemochromatosis when it does that. Or you could take that uh, same concept and instead of making those little green things metal flakes, you can go ahead and make them protein um, because there are some conditions where we get too much protein deposition in muscle. You wouldn't think that would be a problem having protein in muscle, but, you know, uh, we like to think in, in the U.S. that, you know, if some's good, more is better, but that's certainly not the case in most of the cases in the, in the human body. Um, and uh, this would be one of those. We call it amyloidosis, like A-M-Y-L-O-I-D-osis, amyloidosis. And we'll talk about amyloid plaques as a uh, destructive kind of protein when we talk about Alzheimer's disease later in the semester too. So you will see that. But sometimes amyloidosis or hemochromatosis can cause a restrictive cardiomyopathy where, again, the, the heart is the right size. It's just it can't really do its job. It's all crunchy. Okay? Now... Uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out here is kind of jumping back to um, the the old uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So I have this little slide here that the next slide, it's, it's all blown up so you can see it a little bit better. Um, but what we're talking about is thiamine deficiency. Thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency leads to a fairly predictable of dilation 
of the right heart in this case, or really dilation of the entire heart, um, can lead to a, uh, a dilated cardiomyopathy. And I'll talk about this thiamine deficiency or beriberi in a bit, and we'll go into Wernicke syndrome a little bit too, because that's kind of fascinating. But as you can see, any of these uh, myocardial diseases, um, these cardiomyopathies, uh, they act differently, but all of them would have in common that the heart is obviously not working as well. And I do expect you guys to be able to um, understand each one of them, the hypertrophic, dilated, and restrictive, and be able to uh, predict, you know, again, the end diastolic volume in each of those, predict the stroke volume in each of those things, um, you know, predict how efficient that's going to be, if it's going to, you know, cause these signs and symptoms, you know, why would it cause these signs and symptoms? And, you know, the, the short answer is, is obviously if the heart's not working right, things get backed up in the lungs, you don't get enough blood flow through the body, and you're tired and and dizzy and all sorts of things like that. But, you know, try to look at it in, in a little bit of um, critical thinking, okay? So the dilated cardiomyopathy here uh, slide, if you look at this, what you can clearly see from this slide, if we're looking at all the symptoms of uh, that thiamine deficiency, okay, what you're going to see is, is, first off, this guy is emaciated, okay? Emaciation, well, they're skinny, and then there's anorexic, and then there's emaciation. So this person, you know, is very, I'm just wasting away kind of thing. So you can clearly see that the emaciation, the loss of reflexes and the knees, the feet, the wrist drop, the foot drop, um, all of these different things, you can clearly see where a lack of thiamine over a very long period of time can certainly cause um, a lot of nerve problems and muscle wasting away problems. Okay, and along with that, of course, is the dilation of that heart and, and, this, and the stretching out of the fibers so that they can't really contract very well. Okay, the other thing I want to kind of point out is, is down here with the uh, Wernicke's syndrome. Very fascinating. Um, it says you know, that, uh, I forget what it says, the uh, very fascinating with Wernicke's syndrome because it's one of those. Uh, uh, syndromes where people actually uh, have some amnesia where um, they, they kind of lose memories and and sometimes what they would do is they will fill in those memories with something completely made up. Now the patient doesn't know they're making something up. It's called confabulating or they um, have these confabulations and they just kind of fill in a memory that doesn't exist and it doesn't necessarily make sense and you think that well my goodness this person is a pathological liar but in fact they're not their brain just kind of filled in a memory because it didn't really know how to deal with the with the amnesia now having said this how do you get thiamine deficiency in the first place okay if you look back on that past slide it was kind of talking about um, very quickly i don't think i even pointed it out but it threw in here etoh or alcohol okay um, alcohol will interfere with the proper absorption and utilization of alcohol and therefore somebody who is a chronic alcoholic is more likely to end up with this entire clinical scenario with the uh, berry berry chronic thiamine deficiency and uh, all of the symptoms that you see from here okay so that was one of the things that i wanted to point out uh, this is a slide that will freeze it if you like but it's talking about the dilated hypertrophic and restrictive cardiomyopathies um, from a uh, somebody who can obviously draw better than me and, and they're pictures of the same thing okay i'm gonna go ahead and stop this because it's already up to 13 and a half minutes and uh, i'll talk a little bit about congestive heart failure and i get back <laughs>